Well, we ended thinking about resistance and sabotage, and we're now living the dream. Uh, not of um, a return to nature, but of the power of failure, uh, which is where my computer lives, as it can now no longer take USBs in the modern world. It's terrible times. So I started doing some pictures last night, I really supposed to just read this because otherwise I'll take ages. But um, I, b I better do this bit um, because you're going to have to enjoy the rich inner worlds of your own picture making when it comes to the relevant points because I'm not cutting those bits because I like them. Uh, so you'll need some access to Vermeer, Manet, audiences listening to John Cage and Eve Klein, and headphones. Right. Can you manage all of that? All right. So that's about all that you are going to look at. So this is uh, the spectacle of listening. Or what do we look at when we think about listening? And I'm going to clarify at the beginning that I don't think there's anything either timeless about listening or hearing, nor specific to our time. Because reading through it, I was aware that it might look a bit like oh, there's a rich listening through history and now it's all rubbish because people have headphones and whatever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just going, hmm, isn't it curious? Quite often, right? Uh, and signal other things as I'm going along. So it's a kind of great in the small. That's my pitch. There's a lot of listening going on today. A lot of attention paid to hearing, to sound, to openness, to empathic communication, to shared sound worlds. Is it all right, the listening at the back? Excellent. <clears throat> I don't know about, yeah, okay. <laughs> and some of this attention happens in the zone of sound studies, pleased that at least some part of the world around it has finally grasped McLuhan's sense that the future would be full of sound and that the acoustic would be the privileged way of imagining space and social interaction. Without wishing to distinguish too much between listening and hearing today, can we say that hearing more sound is better? Presumably, as writers never tire of pretending, the ears cannot be closed. So to react passively, even submissively, to sound produced by someone else would seem to be less good. Our acoustic ecology has tried to rectify this terrifying prospect of McLuhan's all at onceness and restore the measure of listening in place of unwilled hearing. I'm not going to say any more about that. Much of the hearing is of music, the organization of time through sound. Only now this is consumer space-time being structured by centrally generated and or maintained sound, or not accessible. If not that, then we also have the surprisingly healthy medium of radio, uh, notwithstand government attempts, I don't know what it's like over here, but on Europe there are very consistent government attempts to res uh, restrict the gift-like promise of the medium or long-wave freedom of radio. Or uh, this sound and hearing might come in the form of the noise of people, or even sounds they produce in a private and mobile sound territory emanated by their phone. I will be tempted to mime at some points in this, so just warning you. As retail leaves the cities, maybe all this sound will dissipate, replaced by audio green shoots, perhaps in the clarity of hearing a nearby river or a conversation that doesn't seem too aggressive, too different, too new, too foreign, too fucking loud. But audio predators stalk urban streets, mumbling, shouting, laughing, their eyes glazed. The niche occupied by the illuminated drunk is now taken by the invasive phone wielder, holding their upturned shell, peering into it, talking one-sidedly, imagine me miming that, while the circuit's completion remains unrevealed to the passive listener, the unwitting consumer. There are no objective sounds in the city, only sounds in relation to listeners, contextually constructed listening devices interacting in a mass bone oscillation. It's tempting to say that if there's more for us to hear, then it would be good for us to listen, to apply conscious ears where before our hearing was not being heard but somehow suffered physically. Skipping a bit about disability studies and hearing, I think listening has become so good, so prevalent, so welcome, that it's turned into a personal commodity, a demonstration. Have people ever listened so much to so much music and chat? Has it ever been so explicit? So there goes my timeless claim I put in the beginning. Uh, so we need to go back, even beyond the habitual passage by the door of John Cage, and think of listening as something worthy of seeing, 
There is, of course, a massive history of music in painting and indeed of listening to orators, to lovers, to words from superior beings, a history of attention conveyed through showing and looking at it. Imagine a William Blake picture. Imagine now a Vermeer picture. <laughs> For all the interest of Vermeer's guitar playing girl, announcing the self-reflective humanist subject and a reconception of music as secular philosophy, it's worth having a quick look at Manet's Concert of Tuileries, that's you lot, uh, from 1862, a foundational modernist work in which there is very little sign of the music or indeed of listening, unlike Vermeer's guitar playing picture which shows you the vibration of the strings. Um, or indeed of listening, as Manet's sitters and other figures attend to being seen by concert-going public and painter alike. For modern music in Paris was about attendance, about music as a social condensation. Also, another picture we could imagine here, and I'll mime the male part of this, in the Café Concert, <laughs> we can see a very specific listening at play. Distraction, but also the role of music in permitting distraction, in allowing observation as well as audition. In the social gathering of the Café, uh, also highlighted by Benjamin in his Berlin Chronicle, we do not look at the performers, dedicate multisensory reception to the production of music, but only to listening, as looking is dedicated to the surrounding members of your class. Now, Schaefer R. Murray tells us that audiences only became silent in the 18th century, with their sound-making contribution restricted to points in between those of the musicians. And whilst this heightens the discipline of proper listening, it does also build tension and drive the possibility of a potentially tumultuous and acoustically unpredictable moment of excess. Avant-garde moments of the 20th century tried shaking up audiences in many ways, and here comes the most obvious part, but did anyone try harder than Cage in presenting his silence of 433 in 1952? Uh, we have as many pictures as there are of that event available to us now. Here they all are. The audience becomes a heightening list, heightened listening machine, and in the minutes of silent non-playing, it makes many of the sounds that will fill the acoustic space, and more importantly, makes the piece through its listening. In one fell swoop, Cage had changed the borders between music and non-music, science and sound, performer and audience, and opened the world up as a producer of the, an essential musicality of all things. Yes, okay. But what he also did was create a skilled, trained audience, establishing a practice of close listening of open ears, ready to receive the world. And as this skill was one generated by you, the listener, you could display this skill through your uh, stasis or your knowing movement, your listening face, perhaps. Your understanding of the history of the world being opened up could play gently across your ever so slightly moving head. Hmm. Hmm which is trying to capture slight variations in sound. At roughly the same time, Eve Klein had produced his monotone symphony, seemingly written in the late 40s, theorized further through the 50s, and played in 1960 as part of a performance where models covered themselves in his trademark international Klein blue, pressed their bodies to canvases, producing sub-Matisse imprints in the process. Symphony consisted of one note played for 20 minutes, and then an equivalent period of silence. Unlike Cage's piece, Klein's symphony addresses the divide between music and silence, summons all music into one note, and then dismisses it. Cage fills the world with sound, sound. Klein empties it, a void where once was sound. Um, and there are pictures of that, of a very bemused audience, but also a very attentive audience who are looking more at the performance, I think, than listening anyway. But whatever about their different uh, approaches or the different nature of the pieces, what we have are competing models of attention. Meanwhile, or just before, <laughs> starting in 1942 in Sao Paulo, IBOPE began measuring radio audiences, raising the question further on uh, by, the t by the late 40s and early 50s, as surveys became more targeted, <coughs> not just of listening quantity, but also quality. What kind of listening was going on? What were people doing while they listened to the radio? Um, how much were they listening? How well were they listening? Rock and roll audiences then, so generic stuff about audiences, I'm going to skip that. So rock and genre, concerts, many different practices signifying your commitment to being a certain sort of listener in a given context. But it's when this context goes private on a mass scale that things change, looking retrospectively, and the 1980s saw this in the shape of the Walkman, 
amid more public developments such as the boombox or ghetto blaster, allowing a portable version of the block party and also the uh, mobile phone. All of these are about the transit of sound through the city, all involve machinery that can be seen when in use or merely through being transported. Uh, they can re-territorialize sound, as LaBelle has written, on the, onto the individual as well as the individual moving through space and heighten the possibility for displaying the act of listening. For now, it is the act of listening in itself that is on show, whereas concert performances had established behavioral genre conventions. We'll leave aside the car, which is a different kind of display unit. Uh, we'll also leave aside the timely in in invention of Mike Judge of Beavis and Butthead watching music videos and us watching them. Just take that as read as something excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, and moving to when the Walkman is superseded, barely, as the iPod. Up to this point, what we experienced as those seeing listening was the visibility of it, not its mobilization of display as listening as such. Big claim. Hi-fi headphones were for the secret pleasure of the audiophile. Uh, think of other kind of files, and the, the term suddenly becomes slightly different. I'm an audiophile. <laughs> Is that legal? <laughs> and full of the microscopic, and once you've looked at as many audiophile websites and being tracked by the government agencies for all of that, it feels a bit that way. <laughs> And full of the microscopic variation that Baudrillard identifies in his 1968 book, The System of Objects, or more accurately, Brett Easton Ellis in American Psycho. These new buds for the iPhone would be the sign of adherence to a cult, white, slightly streamlined compared to the already mass-produced and cheaply sold standard earphones that came with the Discman, the shuffling, jittery upgrade of the cassette Walkman, and sadly lacking from our story, uh, the white buds have remained a defining Apple object, even amid a new bloom of variety, once Apple sort of was missing out on the uh, colours and mock aerodynamics of fitness-oriented buds. Imagine a display of those. Different for every discipline. I was trying to find pictures of Pilates earbuds, to be really precise. Couldn't find any as such. But I did see stuff about earbuds <coughs> and mindfulness, so... <laughs> I'm right again. <laughs> For every self-improving and no doubt mindful set of exercises, there are a different type of buds. So earphones offer new possibilities for status identification. And even the white ones now become kind of generic, signal a kind of belonging to a certain kind of rebellion. And also um, today, the access to... Uh, all right, so yeah, yeah, so the rebellion of uh, being the outsider when Apple was that, or people thought it was. And more relevantly uh, today, the access to a big volume of data that previously lived on your iTunes uh, drone device. Uh, so there's a kind of move from stockpiling to access, but that's still the white bud has just changed its specific meaning in the kind of Apple empire. Um, more of that. Things have moved on for the double life, the secret life of the home audio file has blossomed into fertile variegation through what seemed to be real headphones, which dramatically improved the standard of eye machines, as Stern notes in his MP3 book, uh, somewhat foolishly. But he does say it. But I can't help noticing all of these. They're everywhere. They're coloured. Ooh, I'm listening in colour. Advertising their design purposes like upstart wines, telling you what grape they're made from instead of the terroir, the proper place where they've grown over the centuries. And audiophile, websites, and other media are sniffy about these, all these new headphones. They're too flashy. Are they right or wrong? Oh, I don't know. They're not wrong enough, perhaps, for the audiophile. So, Beats by Dre are today's Bang & Olufsen, or perhaps the Christmas tree excesses of 80s, 90s cheap stereo systems. But the point is that allegiance, expenditure, quality, and embrace of the indus industry standard in all of the trimmings, that is what is on show, more and more, I think. In fact, Beats and its imitators, or its purchases for $3 billion, in the case of the industry standard of industry standards Apple, turn the tide on what was the broadening of the public sounding of devices. Because only a few years ago, um, from early mobile phones, look, I've got a phone, to uh, early kind of internet capture friendly kind of phones, there was more of a kind of um, externalizing of the sound producing quality. So people were using them as very low grade uh, boombox kind of 
uh, things, a pathetic, properly pathetic, miniaturizing of the boombox, whatever it was. Now the headphone is the display, and the same can be seen in concerts with the development, these are the kind of out audio files, with the development of a range of in-ear sound delivery, uh, with this delivery of in-ear sound delivery objects came a parallel surge in noise-reducing buds, which you can spend any quantity of uh, money on. Um, <clears throat> and loud concerts will feature the ostentatious display of their use, mimicking the use, both I know what I'm doing here, that I'm a qualified listener, I know what's coming. Look, I'm prepared already. I have them plugged in here, just put them here, ready for the concert. Yeah, okay, let's go. I'm also missing out the silent disco, sadly. Um, <laughs> but these also mimic the use of on-stage earphones used for checking vocal pitch or as general monitors. Um, so that's also going on. All right, I'm heading toward the end. So what's going on with this rendering visible of the act of listening, this rendering visible through the headphone? Is it an assertion of the value of music or more general listening in an era which seeks to cheapen it through easy availability? Is it a land grab of listening by tech companies? Stern observes that the presence in the world of the easily exchanged MP3 format might have removed finance from some parts of the music industry, but it's proved extremely profitable for patent holders, manufacturers, retailers of MP3 and net-friendly devices, telecoms companies, and now headphone makers. Uh, so I priced up some Beats yesterday. Uh, typically, you get you can get the kind of moderate ones for two hundred and nineteen dollars Canadian, up to four three nine for studio. So you can carry your visible studio with you. Incidentally, these prices are nothing compared to the audio files, uh, chosen objects of desire. Now, <laughs> unwittingly, it's. I found something, unwittingly, Chris Ruin, in his uh, 2012 anti-downloading polemic freeloading, he gives us something very curious about where the, the amount of money being spent on listening today. So, he says this, that um, the average spending on CDs or including um, purchase downloads like iTunes and so on, dropped from $71, this is in the States, $71 in 2000 to $26 in 2009 per year. Oh, my God, that's a total collapse of the market. Well, no. Well, uh, yes, but <laughs> actually it tells us how little was ever being spent because the higher figure is one from the year of greatest financial turnover ever in the music industry and the highest ever, not only highest turnover, but also highest profit from musical recorded commodities of any description. And that was it, 71 US dollars. So the amount being spent on devices, on wireless internet connections, even when we discount the profits made by uh, so-called pirates, um, then listening machinery accounts for huge expenditure. And looking beyond the glee of those who man maneuver themselves into the right market positioning by establishing industry standard formats, it seems that demand is truly there. People want to pay, as pro-downloaders pro say, of, yeah, we just want to pay, man. Yeah. Um, but people do want to pay. It's what and how they want to pay, or in a one or two lines, I'm going to say why they might be doing that. So concert sales, um, whatever music is still being sold, is increasingly only of meaning to an already established or in-house media corporation entities or individuals. People want to spend money on listening, not on music. And in fact, this re-territorialization, its radical machine capitalism, is a sort of resistance to dematerialization. The headphone becomes a way of refusing the absence of objects. Listeners have not been weaned nearly as much as we think. Only their fetish is no longer in sound. If that sound is in, um, if that sound is in file form, or typically is, then the desirable object is now in a container that cannot prove to be valueless a few days before or after release. And much more than triumphalist vinyl junkies, Beats Cradle listeners have erected a barrier to piracy by renovating the commodity.